Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming today. Uh, today, we've got a special like campaign wrap up. This is for the Curse of Strahd video. And today I've got with me uh, the DM, the DM for the Curse of Strahd video. Hello. Ah, hey, it was great to be here. And thank you for coming in so we can talk about the game and talk about how it went because we just finished it up. Uh, yeah, well, well, just. I don't know. Just. Times has gone. Some. Yes. Yeah. We so we actually <laughs> wrapped it up earlier this year in uh, February, and so now it's it's like June because it's like you know the the video is like halfway through around episode seven. I'm like, fuck, I really need to be taking notes on this and like actually writing stuff down. Um, it was actually actually it was when I started writing the the replays was around episode five. Was like, okay, I have to get this stuff in writing. <laughs> Um, cause I was like, yeah, cause around episode five, that was when it was like, you know, Strahd was starting to kind of pick up momentum and I was like, okay, I think the audience would like to see some of this stuff. Uh, but anyway, um, one of the first things I want to talk about is that, uh, the RPG replays that I had done, they were sort of Garo's impression or like me from a player, like this is how I perceived the game from my standpoint. And so, uh, there were some issues that came up probably. Uh, and so I want to give our DM, you know, a chance to kind of explain some other stuff or go into some more detail because, um, the problem is that he's, he's telling us details and I'm having to write it down into notes. And so I'm, I'm wondering if there's any like discrepancies that you wanted to talk about between the game and my like retelling or, or what, what happened in my notes. Okay. Yeah. I uh, also, first off, I don't usually record myself as stuff, so if I start stumbling or not, apologies, people. I'm not a professional like Ben is, <laughs> but uh, I'd say for the most part, from what I recall, with because wa- I've watched through all the videos, like I'd say at minimum it was like 90% plus in line with what I did. There was like only like details that really didn't matter too much that maybe were a little bit of scrap things, which honestly it's kind of just streamlined the story a bit for it, so like – as far I don't remember there being anything super out there that really I'm like, oh, no, no, no. It probably should have been like this or whatnot. Because like like even like off the top of my head with the latest video, not the only thing I can like really remember is like, oh, like Madame Ava, like giving them throw a ring of mind shielding. It's like, wait, no, Van, Van Richten had that with him the entire time. But for the sake of the story, it didn't really matter where they got it from. They had they got it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was um, there was a few times where I had I accident I either accidentally had the wrong character say something where it was te- like I knew a character told us something, but I didn't know which one. So like he'd tell us something and I put it in my notes like, oh, we you know, they say this thing, but it's like, crap, who told us that? Like, we know that Strahd is a vampire, but like which character specifically told us that, you know? And it's, yeah, I think even early on, it was especially funny when you were having to kind of try and describe things that happen in like Argon Vostholz and you're just like you have like barely even like secondhand knowledge from what just the players that told you what happened because that was the one session you missed yeah I kind of I had to just sort of describe like well they're going in and like and they sort of told me like there's oh they're going around to different rooms and um there were certain I there were a few things I'm pretty sure I got wrong of like um I, did, I had originally described Casimir as kind of like a leper where he had like sores on his body or like bandages or something like that. And I'm pretty sure that was wrong. I think he just had exhaustion or something like that because I knew he had attendants that were like looking after him. Oh, yeah. If I remember correctly, kind of the description that's like I gave with him was just more of like, yeah, the dude was like halfway to a corpse type of thing yeah. where it's just like lots of joking about like kind of like oh yes he has he unfortunately has the magic cancer but um but yeah so it was just more of like just kind of like wasting away but again it's like minor detail where the whole semi like almost leper in a way like it gets the point across so yeah, yeah uh, so there or there was like there was one time where we went to i think it was the saint Markovia it was like we're talking to you know we go in there and there's he's introducing us all, to all these like uh, mongrel folk and I'm like taking my notes I'm like I'm not gonna remember like how, I'm so sorry like I'm gonna get all these guys wrong because he's like giving us names and like details and stuff like that I'm sure all of your descriptions are correct but like I have to you know translate and stuff or sometimes I'd find something out through the book and it's like oh, my character doesn't technically know this 
Um, oh yeah, or it's like then you read it it's in the book, and you're like, oh, was this something he actually used, or was, did he just skip over this because he didn't actually want it in his campaign? Yeah, or something like I I never knew if Casimir actually had his ears cut off or not because it's like I can't remember that in the actual description, you know. Oh yeah, like, if his ears were cut off or not, or if we just didn't even talk about it or something. Um, but but anyway, uh, kind of moving on from that, um, what was it like running from the module, running from Curse of Strahd? Like, how was it? Oh, boy. Well, um, I guess maybe surprising some people or not, this was the first real module I've ever ran. Like, ah! <laughs> uh, the first campaign yeah, he like, ran as well, yeah. Oh, yeah, the entire first campaign. Because, yeah, I've like done a little bit of stuff with the starter set and whatnot before, but no, Curse of Strahd was the first big one. And um, I'd say... Probably the thing I probably should have asked you to do from the very get-go is uh, there's a subreddit, r slash Curse of Strahd, that I just want to send out the biggest thank you to because they're the just most amazing resource for the Curse of Strahd module. Like, if there's people who, like, have read the book and they're like, oh, where did he, like, get all these homebrew, like, ideas for it? It's like 99% of it is from that subreddit. It's like I just read through the module and I read through that subreddit of all the wonderful ideas that people have put on there in order to pick and choose what I thought were like kind of the best things for our campaign. Plus, it's it's actually it's interesting because Curse of Strahd has been out for, I think, like six years or something. I forget exactly how long. But basically, there is a very because it's one of the more popular modules out there, like a lot of people kind of avoid it because it's like, well, it's really popular. A lot of people know about it. But one of the other advantages of it is that there's so much supplementary material and people have used it and been like, don't do this. This doesn't work. You know, yeah. it sounds like a good idea, but don't do it. And so you could have this kind of like community of of like resource, whereas with some of the newer modules like you don't have that feedback you don't have players saying look we played this this was a terrible you know like what worked and what didn't work mm -hmm. though oddly enough there's even like some that have been like older than that like the tyranny of dragons and out of the abyss that i've been reading it's like there's almost no resources for that stuff really for that's that's yeah that actually kind of makes sense because it's making me realize like it's because curse of strahd is as popular as it is like it's i think i whenever i go online and i look up like oh we're ranking all the modules like curse of strahd 10 if it's not like number one it's at least in the top like four or three yeah for sure because i yeah i'm because i think that was kind of also a big thing when i was like reading like oh like what are like the big like the favorite modules and whatnot it's like curse of strahd was always at the top so I'm like all right i'll read this and it's like oh my god this is D, &D dracula this is perfect yeah because you, yeah, you love dracula <laughs> uh-huh yes i'm definitely like one of those people were that was deep into that vampire phase when it was really big way back when and i just never quite let go of it i just i love all of that mythology mm -hmm. the uh and one of the other things is that i want to bring up is like if you are someone who has listened to, to curse of straw and seen some stuff and been like i think i might want to run it but I don't know, it might be spoiled or something. Curse of Strahd has a few advantages for replayability. One is the tarot, the tarot deck or the, the, the card reading with Madame Ava. And the second mm -hmm. factor is that a lot of the characters are kind of gray. They're sort of like in the middle. And so they could kind of go either way. And so because of that, it creates some really interesting dynamics where you can replay it and have different characters on your side. And plus the tarot reading, which like if if you are not familiar with, when Madame Ava does the card reading, that actually is scrambling up the world. Like it's determining where certain locations are, like where certain items and different things are. And so it's a, it's a randomizer basically to make it so that when you play through it again, there are different things that are, there are different uh, locations that you have to go to, different places. Yeah, for sure. Though, um, like I said, like kind of maybe slight disappointment to like some people would not with it. But if you're planning on running this, one of the first bits of advice that gets put on the subreddit is like fix the deck at least a little bit because there are some things that can come out that just kind of suck. <laughs> I remember you were going through the details of like, oh, yeah, you could just randomly roll and just like the sudden blade is just at the camp with Madame Ava. Like they just find it like right off the gate. And I, I mean, I could see like a certain player being like, oh, that's really cool. But it's like it's you don't get to explore the world like if it's if it's like the, the purpose of spreading out some of the items is to explore certain like cool locations. And so if you have to backtrack or you just find a certain location, it's like if it's too close, like there are certain locations where 
not all card readings are created equal. Some are more interesting than others. Oh, yeah. And I think also most, at least for the items, most of the places that it pops up is kind of somewhere in the castle. So there's a good chance if you just do it purely randomly, you'll ha have all of the items just show up somewhere in Castle Ravenloft. That's actually whenever I, I talk to people online or like I've heard because ever since I did the Curse of Strahd replay and people have been writing to me and telling me their own stories. And I always hear similar stories of like people pull from the tarot deck and it's like, oh, all the items we need are at Ravenloft and they never like get to explore Barovia because um it's just at the castle. So they just go to the castle, you know? <laughs> yeah, which is something I, like, wanted to avoid. So the, like, yeah, definitely peek behind the curtain type of thing with this is for the sake of, like, with the items and whatnot, I basically, I faked the deck pulling for that just because it's like, I want this to be a really interesting story. I want them to go and experience everything and have a reason to experience everything and so it's like the items were put in certain places so that way the party would kind of have to go there, which I know there's a lot of people saying like, oh, like railroading and whatnot. It's like, well, sometimes railroading is the most interesting way to do things. No, no, I, I totally agree with that because it's like the the problem is that if, if this stuff is like optional, like really, really optional, like it's you you like at, us as players want to go and explore and have a reason to go there and stuff like that. And we, we want to do that. And, and so there has to be these, these mechanisms to get us from point A to point B. Yeah, for sure. But yeah, the only one that I really kind of left up to chance was who the destined ally was going to be. Cause with that one, there's just, there's so many really cool people you could meet up with that are your ally and really all the destined ally in the module means is oh on their turn they get an extra action that lets them just grant inspiration to a party member while they're fighting strahd so but it's like kind of it is like a sort of special thing with it so it's like all right let's let that be random and you guys happen to pick esmeralda for yours which probably one of the most powerful ones you could have randomly gotten yeah, yeah, yeah. And and uh, we really liked having her on a party. She was pretty cool. What uh, On that side note, what is your favorite NPC that you ran in the module? Oh, favorite NPC? I mean, Esmeralda's up there. It, I mean, it kind of... Plus, you, plus also with Esmeralda, you had a really good accent for her. And I was like, the second you gave that accent, I'm like, fuck, I can't do that. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, the, yes, my, my attempt at a French accent. It was, that was kind of that was fun mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh but yeah like also like some people who are familiar with like dice camera action like probably knows like i definitely pulled some stuff for what esmeralda's path was in there from that show as well for i guess kind of spoilers though it's been out for a while so i'm not gonna feel too bad about those who don't know about that mm -hmm. but yeah esmeralda was a lot of fun um i guess also like being strahd is also just the best <laughs> Oh my God, he's he's such a good villain, you know. He's such a one of the and and that's actually a big part of what makes you know the the module as endearing as it was is because he just he's such an asshole, you know. Oh, he, yeah. And he's constantly involved in the players' actions and stuff. And he's just um, he has like he has a very like interesting motivation. Um, and his his character is like, you know, his character, you get to know his personality. He's not like one of those like cultists that's like off doing some evil spell and you never know his name or you forget it or something. Yeah, no, basically in a way he's kind of like always like in your face. And there's definitely like some advice out there that says like, have him always in the party's face, just always being an asshole there with the way I ran it. Like I kind of at first had him sort of be at least appear to be a, background villain where you don't know like okay does he even really care that we're here because it seems like all of his lackeys are just kind of messing stuff up when like so is he just really like kind of what fiona said in the beginning where he's just like he's just a landlord that doesn't care about anything but then by the end you realize oh no he's still pulling all the strings that's going on here even if no one knows it yeah i think it was particularly like episode five was when like should hit the the rebellion episode was when it's like oh he's he gives a shit you know he's like really involved um and it's also it's really good because it um 
particularly that scene where he like invites us to dinner is that he's like he's not really takeable like at that point we can't really fight him or if we can it's like a 0.1 percent chance like we have to get super lucky and um i think that the only that was kind of the only way to have that scene was he has to be in a position of power and be like you know invite us to the castle because if he was takeable at that point like we would have tried to kill him you know, kind of a thing. So we have to be we have to be at a huge disadvantage, you know, for this oh, yeah. that scene to work out. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That whole because like, yeah, in the book, it doesn't give like great like time for it. It's kind of just like, oh, when you think the party has done something that really should grab his attention. And so it's really kind of got a balance of like. All right. Are they their power? They should the party should be powerful enough that they feel comfortable going there, but not too powerful so that way once they get there, they don't just want to start duking it out. Yeah. Type of thing. And I definitely, I definitely have heard a lot of like people talking about like what power level should the players be? Because some people, I've even heard on like subreddits, people play the game where they come in at like sixth level and they just start wrecking face to like okay we got to take this take names and stuff like that and i think there there is a version of that that's like people can play but that may not be as it is designed like the the design of curse of strahd is it's a very brutal game oh yeah no i definitely like all in all i'd say like i think despite like kind of being the first campaign I think like it pretty much almost the entire time like met and exceeded what i hoped kind of would happen <laughs> Yeah, we definitely we went away from every each of the sessions like, holy fuck, like, what are we going to do? Like, very, like, very, it was very tense for us. And we really enjoyed that Um, because it's like I think in a lot of other games, we'd kind of gone into it like, oh, we played it and it's fun. And then we just kind of leave for the night and it's like what happened last week. But it's like this this one in particular, we were very invested in kind of the plot line and like we we really wanted to stick it to him as the villain. Oh, yeah, because like, yeah, I've definitely saw like some comments there were saying like, why? does it do people like this module it feels like you're just always losing like why would you want to play this how is this fun and i think kind of the biggest turn was post dinner when you guys then went up against the hags and finally won is kind of why you put up with all the weeks to months of just losing is because that victory is just the sweetest thing at that point so uh yeah i think i think it's really nice like the hag victory and stuff but you know what's funny is that even if we had lost i still would have found that to be enjoyable and fun because it's really like and and this is it actually has to do with me as a player is that i i really like that tension and i really liked the we don't know what's going to happen next kind of a thing and so even if it's like more bad stuff like that was um it was still like really interesting um but anyway, I uh, moving on to the next topic. Um, yeah. The next, the most popular comment that I ever got, I got it constantly. Everyone was writing to me about this. How did the dark gifts work? <laughs> and they also were asking about the hags as well. And I even have, I have the hags thing right here. But we, the so first we'll start with the hags. <laughs> um, okay, yeah, hags once again. R slash curse of I want to say user. Dragna Carta, because most of the things I do was either uh, his stuff or this another user, Mandy Mod. They wrote, they write up these two Curse of Strahd guides that are just phenomenal. And I want to say it was uh, from his that I got it from. I don't know if he made it up himself or if he also got it from a different source and just got it into the notes there. But yeah, the hag stuff, there was a whole list of like, here's if they lose some hag deals that the players could potentially take in order to go. Yeah, there's um I actually I listed out the the four. It's your last breath, your victory, your memory, or your silver tongue. The silver tongue is disadvantage on social checks. Memory is disadvantage on any of the knowledge checks. Victory is that you can't make a final blow on a weakened enemy. Um and then your last breath, we already did that. That was one of your death saving throws. You lost. Oh, yeah, that's pretty much what everyone chose there. God, it would have been hilarious if Garo, ch- Garo chose the silver tongue because he was already so bad. It was actually was funny as people were commenting as like, he should have taken that because it's not like it's going to do him any good anyway. And I'm like, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so um, then we have the dark gifts. And how did those work? Okay, so yeah. So that one was a mix of... Uh, kind of my own thing as well as what I took from the Curse of Strahd subreddits. But 
basically the way those guys worked in this campaign was well before i should, I should probably we should probably go into what exactly are the dark gifts in the curse of straw module itself because they do exist in there i'm just not a fan of them as written because it's basically you get to the amber temple you go into these crypts you touch it they say hey i have a dark gift for you do you want it you say yes, and a lot of them is like, oh, you can cast the spell Lightning Bolt three times, and then it's gone. But you get that. You have to also do a DC like 15 Charisma save or something like that, which if you fail, you just lose control. Your character becomes an NPC that's evil that the DM now controls. Yeah, and so multiple problems. I mean, one is obviously the other thing that it's it's at the Ember Temple, and so it's like kind of towards the end of the game that you are acquiring this stuff. And it's like, sometimes players want to have some stuff like earlier on. And then that whole like random, like you're, you're now evil. <laughs> you're now a bad guy. Yeah. That's always so meh. And it's the same thing with as written the way, like a lot of the, like like and throw stuff works where it's just like, man, this just seems like a not great mechanic. <laughs> yeah. And but. plus, plus I think there was even, uh, did you, were you the one that heard stories of like people with high charisma or something and high saves, like touching a bunch and then getting a bunch of powers and then someone else touches it and then suddenly they're evil. So it's like, it's really, yeah. Where it's like, even, yeah, it was like someone like, I want, I'm blanking off the top of my head, which class is like, I want to say it's something like the sorcerers or the warlocks. Like they have proficiency in charisma saves or a palette. Oh my God, a paladin. Yeah. For some reason, if the DM is okay with a paladin going around touching these like all these dark powers they've got their aura that gives them bonuses so they basically double dip in that so they almost can't fail the save so they can just go around grab every gift in the temple without any consequence aside from the like some of them have like pseudo flavorful other costs to them but yeah just all in all i just i wasn't a huge fan of how that one works so uh like i don't know like i can go into the more nuances of the mechanics that i did or unless you have another comment with them Mm. Um, yeah, you can go like, uh, I don't necessarily have another comment with them per se. Like you can go into the details or we could just move on to the next thing. Per se. Okay. Yeah, no, I'm happy to go into those details with it. Um, so basically the way that I did it was from, we started at level three because a lot of people were wondering levels that would go for the whole campaign. We started level three, ended at level 11, uh, level three, they came in and from three to five, I just had it where if anybody died, I gave them the option of coming back with a dark gift. So the whole joke of like Stan Bell saying, and then Garo coming back when not, that was, that was optional. And yeah. uh, Ben decided to come back with that. <laughs> um, oh yeah. Yeah. Cause I think, I think there was some percent, like whenever I tell a story and I like, I make a joke, it's like, was, you know, like, was he crossing a line? Like, was he, is he trying to tell us something? It's like, no. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. So from zero to five, there was a, there's a little bit of a kind of, saving because curse draw like a lot of modules but curse draw especially can be very brutal at low levels like so many things just will kill you and like and i mean you start off in the death house yeah things are gonna try and kill you so from zero from three to five they had a little safety net of if they died they could get their gift to at least the first stage of the gift then i think it was at level seven they have the option of accepting more of the gifts and they get a bit more power than a level nine. They once again, get a little bit more. And then once they get to the temple is when they get to make that final save. All right, I want it all. Just give it all to me, which with the last episode you found out there actually might be some extra hidden strings attached to that. That's were never known, but they also had the option like half the party did of just going, no, like I'm done. Something just seems really off. And I don't want this anymore. So in a nutshell, that's kind of what it yeah, was. Yeah, because that kind of ties into the next question was someone asked, how would Krosk and Boshak's endings have been different if they had said yes to their patrons? Um, so the way that their stuff probably would have been different is Krusk's in a way might have been kind of similar where he would have ended up probably going around the demiplanes kind of being a conquering force because his whole thing was 
get all the way into the orc side of things where they like are tied in with grumsh where it's all about who is the strongest how do we get the most uh like power so we can win in the afterlife so his thing is he was just going to be almost like a berserker type of thing and there were some mechanics with it too uh basically he would become a oh i'm blanking on the name of it but there's that fiend orc that's in volo's guide and basically he would become that and then with Boshax, his thing was leading all the way to he was going to become a lesser form of that ultimate yuan T type of snake, multi-headed snake creature. And in terms of what his post game is, I'm trying to remember if I had actually mapped anything out for that yet or if that was basically... Part of the thing where it's like, all right, I know there's going to be a bad consequence for this, but since he just out of blue denied it, it's like, okay, I don't actually have to plan for that anymore. Okay, got it. Um, So now we're going to get into, uh, what do I want to, okay. (laughs) Um, I I think we'll deal with a few kind of smaller questions that people were curious about. Um, One was time and travel. One was how long were the sessions that you guys were playing? And I can answer most of the time it was like three to four hours. Um, Yeah. Most of the time it was just basically just after work. I'd we'd all come over to your place and then it would be from what? Six to 10 really. Yeah. 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 Somewhere around there. Well, I mean, we'd, we'd play to like 10 and then we just keep talking until like midnight. Cause that's, cause that's what we do. 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 But um, we're nerds and love to talk about all the stuff. Yeah. We got to talk about the game and how screwed we are. (laughs) But it's, it was like, cause people were curious about how much like material we were getting through and stuff. And I mean, towards the end of the, of the replays, I had to combine a few of them and some of them would be like 50 minutes. But I think it was also just because we we sort of had a smaller group. You know, we're four people. Uh, Cross tends to be a little bit small, like kind of quiet. So really, there's sort of three talkative characters. And we don't really role play a lot of kind of the like town stuff. Like we, we kind of get the info and it's like, OK, and then we role play a little bit. But we don't necessarily get stuck as much. And I think you were pretty good at sort of saying like, OK, here's the next thing. And then we, we yeah. never were like, oh, God, we're like three sessions into Velaki. And it's like you're sitting there like, why don't they just talk to the homeless bum on the street? Like it's been three. I've told them like four times that there's this bum they need to talk to, but they have it, you know, or something. <laughs> yeah, I'd say I definitely describe our group as we are we are very efficient gamers. And I also do mean gamers because we're all like pretty we like playing video games and whatnot so a lot of the times our DD sessions are very much sort of like video games in the way they run we all kind of have that same thought process where it's like okay the dm is giving me this hook this hook this hook so i can follow these ones up or see which one is the most interesting that i think is most helpful so mm-hmm. there's definitely like i've read stories of groups that get bogged down like Velaki, where yeah they are there for literal months uh outside of game because they're just talking and getting the info on every little detail in there while the story isn't really going anywhere, which just isn't really our style. Yeah. And I, I think we've both played, you know, like, uh, or I, we've, I've, for me, definitely I've played like the kind of game where it's like very slow and you take your time and you do a lot of role playing and stuff like that. But I think we had kind of gone into Curse of Strahd like, you know, we want to play it over like three, four months and we kind of want to, you know, see what it has to offer and then sort of move on to another thing. Like we kind of were not like if you had said like, oh, I'm going to run it for a year, we would have been like, eh, like we would have appreciated what it's oh, that's who that's that's quite long, you know. Yeah, we all definitely we wanted to get through the module like we wanted to have the full experience, but it wasn't it wasn't a world we wanted to live in for years of Mm -hmm. our real life. Plus, I definitely know like the villain comes in and it was ah, it's like really exciting. And it's like there's this building up, building up, building up of tension. But what happens is it starts dropping off at a certain point where you're just like, okay, and then you like with like really long campaigns, sometimes you get to a point kind of towards the end where you're just like, oh, it's over like you're not feeling like yeah that like gratifying sense of accomplishment i th- i actually think that the amount that, of time that we spent on it was like the perfect time or like it, it was really close for us personally oh yeah no i definitely like feel the same because there was definitely like especially by the end of it when it was like the battle was over we did the epilogue one not i'm just like 
oh my God, thank God that went okay because I'm ready to take a break from just, I think, D&D and gaming for a bit because this burned me out. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because you, you spent quite a bit of time kind of going on the subreddit and doing stuff and taking notes and writing stuff up. Yeah, which, yeah, a lot of that's also, I think, a uh, mix of just my personality, but also being like, as I said, like this kind of being my first big campaign is I probably almost in a way I feel like I spent more time than I should have. Cause it's all, it was like, I spent all the time trying to plan out every possibility instead of just going like, no, 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 just have stuff ready and then be just willing to see where it goes. And that's something I think you just have to learn as a DM. Sometimes you just gotta let it go and like, just realize you've planned enough. Yeah. What was, what part of the module do you struggle with the most? Is, is that kind of related uh, that it's, um, part of the module I struggled with the most, um, I know probably one of the biggest things, the whole, like the dinner was a big one, but also I think that was one of our longest sessions that we've ever spent. Yeah. We, we spent that, I think we played that session for 10 hours or something. I, I forget exactly how long, but, um, we spent, it was like the rebellion plus the church plus the dinner and then the fight with the hags or something like that. And it was like, we felt really like it was a long session. It was like, we felt accomplished, but woo, we spent a long time at that dinner. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, that one, that was a lot. Um, other than that, parts of the modules that I struggled with. Other than that, I think the other, only other part that I really like was stressed out about the most was probably the final battle just because like, like kind of like as DM of story, it's like it, two certain and like I want I wanted you to win, but I'm wasn't gonna give it to you. No, I definitely no, I I agree with that because it's like I could definitely tell you're like I want it to be like a legitimate fight. You know, I don't want it just to be like you go in there and you punch him in the dick and he falls over like ah this is champion and you just like kick him in the face once and he's fine. Yeah. And it's also because like our characters were very powerful that time and we had a lot of NPCs and stuff and so you had to like figure out the balance of how do I make it challenging for eight characters or whatever? You know, we, we had two unicorns at that time. I omitted the other unicorn oh and we had Van Richten <laughs> and then let's ignore Morn Kanan. Uh, then we had, you know, the, the entire party and Esmeralda and Godfrey. Oh, freaking Godfrey. Like, yeah. yeah see, I don't know if you had it planned there, but it's like sort of like, little like kind of hiccups or it's like what would i do differently if like i had to like redo this campaign uh one of the first thing that always comes to mind we we talked about this plenty of times was that draco lich fight just seemed like the most for me it seemed like one of the most underwhelming fights of the entire campaign yeah because the draco lich uh, comes out it's like ha ha and there was there was even a line I said where I was like I found out it's a Draco Lich I'm like oh I'm filled with all kinds of regret now and you go into the fight and just because mechanically it doesn't have as as much like stuff that it can do yeah but it's also I think the kind of the I realize like it's one of those things where looking back on it it's it comes down to Godfrey where DMs if you're looking to like maybe sway like what kind of party member like to add to your party and whatnot don't give them godfrey godfrey is the most overpowered npc in the entire goddamn module because oh, everyone was talking about morden kanan like why is morden kanan in this thing because he's like he, mechanically he's an archmage which is you know he's like cr9 like he's powerful and stuff but like the the huge advantage of godfrey is that he's a paladin he can't die he's a revenant so he just like he dies and then he just comes back and even if you like cut him up he just goes to a different body so he can like inhabit different bodies and then he's immune to a lot of strahd's things like if he tries to charm him it doesn't do anything if he tries to turn him into a vampire it does nothing you know he's already dead yeah and like if i think i accidentally like bumped him up a bit because there's some stuff attached to Vladimir that I also transferred over to Godfrey. But like as a revenant, Strahd has chosen an enemy, which means he also deals additional damage to him. Plus Paladin, he's got freaking smites, which are just devastating on all kind of 
undead and i mean basically just all it matters is undead because everything in curse of strahd is undead plus strahd is also like his character is a glass cannon so he, oh, yeah. he like his bane of his existence is paladins who run up to him with smite and he's a revenant and he does bonus damage and stuff like that so he's he's really good against and plus he's immune to a lot of strahd stuff so he's really good and very effective yeah. So, yeah, that's, I'd say, like, kind of, yeah, in hindsight, Godfrey was definitely like, oh, I I should have just won the Draco Lich Skull got put in. Maybe I should have just had him go to rest with everyone. But at the same time, that last fight was so close that not having Godfrey there could have, like, tumbled it into just everyone dies. Okay. So. So um, the so there's a few all right so there's a bunch of questions I'm gonna try and figure out which ones people want the most I think we'll deal with this one is this is gonna take a while it says what was in the book that well, like what's originally in the book and what did you add and obviously we can't go through everything because it's like you know there's it's a big book there's a lot of stuff um, uh, yeah most of the NPCs that are used in the book like they're in there you know kind of stuff like you'll have them in different locations or they had different motives or something like moved them around a little bit but like all of the npcs like morton canaan he's supposed to be there and even like the actually what was funny was i think people thought that the mad the original mad mage encounter was um not in the book like the like strahd before a year before the um the events of this book like morton canaan comes in and he fights Strahd and then he loses. He gets his ass handed to him and he like goes off in the woods and like hides. And I think that, and that's actually in the book. Uh, Cause yeah. I think, I think some people were really surprised about that, but that's. Yeah. The Mad Mage is something that's kind of easily cut because not unless he's your chosen ally, you don't really get to him at all. But like, yeah, that lore is all planted in there. And it's just, I think it's kind of one of those little like, Wizards of the Coast, like, nods of, like, hey, hey, we've got Morden Morden Kanan. I keep wanting to say Kanan, which is technically correct, but Kanan is the more common. I did it so often in the script reading. I'm like, Morden Kanan. I'm like, uh, retake, because it's, like, technically speaking, it's Morden Kanan. Yeah, like, I'm pretty sure there's a thing where Chris Perkins had said, like, both are legitimate, you just hear Kanan more. So it's like, okay, gonna go try and do Kanan then, but... Mm -hmm. yeah. But uh, yeah, but yeah, with the Mad Mage thing, uh, though, with Mad Mage is probably the one thing I'm kind of most proud of because it's the thing that I actually added was the whole circle of eight uh, puzzle room to get over to him. That's like I obviously took inspiration for those puzzles from other things, but kind of assembling all into that thing was pretty much as far as i know my brainchild unless i'm totally forgetting another source <laughs> yeah it's it was a, a great scene you know kind of doing that because i think in like the original book you just kind of find him there and it's like look he'd you know he's a wizard like he'd, he'd probably have some puzzle or something you have to do like it's a great opportunity to have that kind of thing there um mm-hmm. but anyway going through some of the di- the things that were changed i don't yeah. know how much stuff we're going to be able to get through one is the brides and they're the uses of them gertruda the dark oh, gifts God. the dark gifts we already talked about mm-hmm. the ending um the pool in kresk irena and oh. tatiana and sergey their kind of like relationship the magic stones and the skull of argenvost we kind of talked about a little bit yeah so yeah we can go through each of those one by one uh but yeah i guess would you mind uh what was the first on that list so the first one i was talking about was the brides yeah, so the brides in the book, you kind of just meet them in the castle, and that's kind of it. So those ones, I definitely expanded them a bit where uh, there was like sources on the Curse of Curse of Strahd subreddit that I took a lot of inspiration from. But I definitely decided like, no, I want these brides to be a lot more in the party's face and really have them also be sort of lesser antagonists that you just hate along the way. And then I also bump them up a bit because as written, they are just vampire spawn and that's it. So with that, I, I took. Yeah, I would ahead. have been so irritated if it was just vampire spawn. Let me tell you, like I wanted to fight like another, like I wanted them to be like, maybe not on the same level as, as Strahd, but like powerful in their own right. Cause I think vampire spawn are like, really, they just kind of run at you in the kind of claw claw and bite. That's kind of it. Yeah. And especially once you have the sun sword, they are nothing like, 
I've got kind of a joke. Like I like to say that, oh, if the encounter seems too easy, I just add more goblins. But like goblins would put up more of a fight once you have the goddamn sun sword than a vampire spawn. It kills them immediately. Yeah, it does like 20 points of damage every round, you know, or something like that. And whenever we brought out the sunlight, you're like, okay, I have to focus fire and, you know, or something or use Rahadine or something in this fight. (laughs) So after the brides, Gertruda. Gertruda. There was one post on Curse of Strahd I read and I just got so attached to it where someone was like, I don't like having Gertruda in the castle because like, it's just, I think if I remember correctly, she's like 16 in the module and as written, you find her like sort of half undressed in Strahd's bed. And I just, I didn't like it. I did not like that at all. So I'm like, I'm going to do something different here or just cut her out of the story entirely. Cause I don't like this. I, I have heard uh, DMs do stuff where it's like, Oh, you're eating dinner with Strahd and Gertruda is like on his lap. And he's like petty stroking her or something. And the players were like, what the fuck? Like, this is like, this is crossing a line. Yeah. yeah. Like Strahd, like every, like there was so many jokes already. Like Strahd is like the epitome of like what kind of like we would call an incel type of thing. Like he's just the most despicable thing you could ever imagine. But like, even then that, like that is line. Like, I don't want to present that i don't want to play that out i just don't want it so yeah instead i decided oh yeah no instead she got abducted by hags and eaten and turned into a hag instead which is (laughs) a little bit more deep hag lore but yeah with gertruda there was a post on curse of strahd where someone had decided to rework the hags where instead of being three night hags i think it was uh morgantha was still a night hag Oh, one of the other daughter whose name I'm blanking on right now, she was, I think, a lesson to a green hag. But then Gertruda as Ophali was replaced Ophalia. And then she was an Agus, Agus hag, I believe, the like big one. But with me, I'm like, I'm going to, I like this idea of her as a hag because it streams like things better. It lets her still be useful, or at least that's still a part of the story, but without all that other extra stuff to it. So instead she got put there and it's made it so it made hags, I think just a little bit more complicated than I think I'd ever really seen them portrayed before. Nice. Nice. Yeah. And I think it worked out and it gave us this really weird situation where it's like, okay, we got this kid and they've been turned. They're a hag now. Like what are we going to do with them? <laughs> you know? mm-hmm. And there, there was kind of that irony where like I had at the end, I was, the Garo was like trying to say like, Oh, I'm taking her under my wing. And it's like, I'm going to be good. And I'm going to be making sure she stays good. And really he went evil. And then I uncovered, I found out that she stayed good. Like she never turned. <laughs> yeah. Cause it's just kind of, yeah, it's just the way everything played on the way. Like everybody like kind of like treated her as it's just like, I just for me, like with the way the character is going that like she from the get go was kind of raised like the only like kind of it was a curse rod edition, but our stress curse of Strahd edition. But the dog Lance a lot. And the whole reason it's called Lance is because she's this just totally innocent being who has fairy tales just filled up with her head. So her whole thing, even though she got like turned evil, and was doing like these horrible, atrocious things she met these heroes who tried to change things. And so she's like, Oh, maybe like I can do that. And then there was the whole bat, uh, better ba- uh, besta. And they tricked her and like, no, those heroes killed your dog. They're like, they are evil. You need to join us to be good. And sure that she got played at the end of it as well, after talking to Garo. So she's just like, I'm just, I want to just try to be good. That's all I, I Gertrude want out of life now yeah it was interesting because um it it was none till like kind of after the fact like like gertruda like we kind of ignored her like okay we don't know what what's up with her she's just gone and then we encounter her and then we uncover that there was this entire like plot line of where it's like the enemy has like she's now in the enemy's clutches and they're trying to like 
how do you convince this good character to side with the villain and how there has to be this like underlying, like you had to think of these underlying motivations for the villains to like bring her over to their side and why would she be working with them and why would she hate Gouda and stuff like that. And it was at the end, she's like, you lied to me and stuff like that. And I was like, okay, I don't have time to deal with this, but like, (laughs) this is a problem probably. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and then and then like kind of towards the end we we uncover like all the like her interaction with the villain and how she had gotten used by them mm-hmm. yeah um but anyway moving on to the next thing um mm-hmm. the one of the major changes was the ending because um ah. so with the ending i actually i think part way through the game i told you that i kind of had some inkling of how the game ends and the reason what i basically said is like look i've played DD before i've played a bunch of different modules and i know that most DD modules do like a hard reset thing where you get to the end and it like just kind of you go back to square one or something or it's like um yeah. like you kill a guy but then he kind of comes back and it's it has to do with the fact that in DD, in the way that the modules are written like you can never really kill the villain because there's all these work all this like material that's made off of those characters and so it's like if you go around like if you kill all the enemies like now suddenly these other modules are invalidated and so they kind of like sort of and plus you know barovia still has to exist and stuff like that and so i kind of like i was talking to to my um to our dm and i was basically explaining like look you know i kind of I, I sort of know it's going this way. And then you had said like, well, I don't like that either. I kind of have my own ideas on how the ending's going to be. Yeah, for sure. And the path we ended up taking was definitely inspired by uh, the, uh, I'm blanking on all these things, but it, like Chris Perkins had the podcast where everybody went through probably the most famous D&D podcast outside of Critical Role. I'm blanking on it. Dice uh, action. <laughs> That's it. Yes. Thank you. Dice Cam Ration. Because they start off in Barovia and they went through their old venture. And yes, like a spoiler for DCA if you guys don't know already. But like at the end of at least the first sort of arc, they have crafted this ritual to trap Strahd so then they can get out of Barovia. And I wasn't a fan of how it played out in DCA, at least with that first arc. That's where I ended. So I don't know what happens after that. I think there is some other stuff that happens later on with Curse of Strahd. But I liked the idea, though, of, okay, maybe a way to beat Strahd is to just trap him and get him out of there, and which then opens up other possibilities. But it's that solves Strahd where you don't have to worry about him reincarnating for whatever hand wavy reasons dark powers say no we're not done with you yet come back to life so that's with that one that's just i like the the just like kind of personal referencing is like i liked that idea as a possible ending for you guys and it seemed like you guys liked liked it enough to run with it yeah so one yeah so you have like the trapping was one of the things you could either kill him trap him and then the other thing is you could put someone else under the throne and then the the fact that you had madame ava come out and then kind of do the card reading for um like which characters could get put on the throne and which ones couldn't and i really liked the options that came up and the reason why i liked it is because there, there wasn't just like oh here is the good option where which solves all the problems and here is the bad option where you you screw over everything it's like you could actually make a case for each of the different options that we we had in front of us like uh victor uh arabelle uh gouda uh gouda you know and yeah, so <laughs> like and it's actually inter- it, the thing i love it like uh i think that some people wouldn't be as big of a fan of like uh it's kind of like it's a hard choice but i th- that's something I really enjoy is that you could kind of like look at the comments and see like everyone has a different person that it's like should have been Victor, Victor all the way, you know, he's the guy or something like that, or we should have done this. And if, if I recall, and I don't know if this was actually still in the notes or if you kept it in, but Strahd was going to give us a proposition, you know, like when, yeah. 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 With that one, that was basically, which I guess kind of in a way, the only like quote unquote like good ending perhaps may have actually been the proposition. I'm trying to remember all the details with it, but it was basically going to come down to Strahd was gonna, if you guys had decided to, instead of just start attacking it, then there it would have gone and he would have given you the proposition of, Hey, we can fight this out. 
I'm probably going to win, but like there's a chance I won't. But here's the thing. You guys are going to be screwed because somebody's going to be left here. There's a way we all get out, and that's we go back to the Ember Temple and we just kill all of those little vestiges of the dark powers that are in that place. Probably not going to be permanently put them down because they're parts of gods, but if we destroy all of them, then that's going to just basically free up this place for a minute so people can just get out, just mass exodus out of here. But his condition would have been, you guys sit through and let him do the wedding. Mm -hmm. I, so I, I, the problem, and actually it's interesting because it's, it's another great option because it's like, uh, I don't know if I would have done that because one is like, you're sacrificing Irina to have this thing Mm -hmm. happen. And um, then the other problem on the table is it, it sort of feels like a high risk, high reward thing because we could lose everything there in like, if we decide like, okay, we're going to kill the things like even Strahd himself could escape and be like, ha ha ha, screw you guys. And like, just go out into the world. And now he's released from his prison and stuff. And like, you know, and so that was, you know, it's, it's another tough choice kind of a thing, but like, it is, it's, like we, you realize kind of in the end, like, oh man, the dark powers are really a problem, you know, kind of a thing. Like we need his help to defeat the dark powers and stuff like that. So it's, um, but basically the, that option, because we never talked to him because we were like, no, we are not working with Strahd. Like we didn't have that. Op- like the option was available. It's just that we were like, we were, we were like, we're going to burn everything down at this point yeah, for everything much. is going down. Um, but that kind of, uh, tails into the next question where people were asking what would happen if Strahd actually married Irina or tried to or married Tatiana could he have done it and would anything have happened so my thing with it was with the marrying of uh of Irina and like trying to and turning her into like vampire into Tatiana is in with everything you guys had done up until that point you guys would have had to have chosen between teaming up with Strahd or sticking with your allies because Ez, Richton, and uh, Godfrey were not going to let that happen. Okay. So that would have been kind of the big thing where it's like, he, you, if you guys were like at that choice, then your allies would have gone, no, we're going to end this now and then you kind of would have had shows all right no we think the strahd team up with strahd is going to be the best way to have like this kind of good ending type of thing but it would have cost you losing arena because she would have been just totally turned and it would have cost you your allies because they would have you would have had to have fought them or stood back and let strahd fight them which they probably would not have survived well what the other question i have is like let's say we go into the fight and we lose we just handedly lose to strahd and he then turns Irina and marries her or something like that. He had originally claimed that this would end the curse. I assume that he was lying or wrong or something like that. Um, I'm trying to remember because there's things like that where it's like, it's definitely like at that point, it's all kind of my world and what it was doing. And yeah, because the book actually does not go into details on what happens. Actually, I think he, it does let me <laughs> I, I don't think the book ever assumes he ever like oh no, no no wait i think it might actually where it's like he leaves like one person alive so then arena is a vampire and like feeds on them or something akin to that because they like, yeah there's different yeah. ways to interpret it because i think the dark powers like they make like i've seen some interpretations where it's like 100 percent cannot physically happen period he he cannot the dark powers will always stop it <laughs> Yeah, they're generally, that is like the way it always like says it happens. I think that the way that it would have had to play out, because it would have ended up having to basically be an epilogue type of way, which I'm kind of at this point, it's like of like half a mind either way, where one is like, yeah, she gets turned into a vampire. And then uh, the one person that gets like left behind her cannot die, like say, because it's like Gouda's Re- resurrections or even Garo technically had something akin to that as well because he accepted the gifts like while they're resurrecting the dark powers aside hey they're gonna be more fun and so Strahd can like get out during that interim oh those fuckers 
that and that then, would be that would be such a shitty ending that you like i have to suddenly claim the throne and then scrod just escapes out into the world yeah the other alternative like any with that i can see is like strahd gets everything that he wants and then it's like we kind of like skip forward like 100 years something like that where it's still like the Guda Garo thing where they're just getting killed because their friends are all dead. It's just those who they can't do it. And Strahd's like realizing like, fuck, I have her now. And it's not actually what I wanted. And then it gets into more of like, for people who like know some of the lore, there's a whole like Lord Soth or whatever that he was in the Demi Plane of Dread until he just, just decided, nope, I'm done. Like you're tormenting me with this shit. And I just don't care anymore. Like I'm just... I'm just going to sit here. I, I don't care anymore. I'm done. And it would basically be akin to that with Strahd. So he's just like, I'm just, I'm done. And then the demi planes would basically then like, all right, then we don't care about you anymore. And they just eject him out. Yep. So it would have kind of been the same way either way with that. But that's kind of how I imagine if you guys had lost the final battle, that's how the epilogue would have gone. Mm-hmm. Okay. So um, as uh- Part of the ending also includes there. There's sort of two things related. One is it involves Irina, Tatiana, and Sergey, uh, because Sergey did not <laughs> like. Because sometimes people have Sergey show up in the ending, and then also the pool in Kresk. So I think we're first going to talk about the Sergey ending because our I. So people were actually asking me what happened to Irina during the end because I'm like, oh, I totally forgot about her. Like in my notes, <laughs> I think, and this is. I, I talked to the other people because I was like, oh, I think she just kind of like left off and she did whatever. And then I think I was talking to someone else and I said, didn't she like go off and like so go adventuring or something? W- what actually happened to I- our Irina? Because I kind of forgot about um, her. Yeah, say with Irina, she just she got she got to leave. I don't remember if we followed me because I don't think she really she didn't join up with any of you of you guys afterwards. She just wanted to go out on her own life because I'm pretty sure. Like her brother was gonna stay in Barovia because he was the burgomaster. Yeah, the lead correct. Master. We're like, we need to put you in charge. We need someone in charge. You're gonna be in charge. So we put Ismark in charge, and Irina, you know, escaped out into the into the world. And we kind honestly, we kind of like lost track of her. Like there was, she wasn't adventuring with anyone else, so we kind of don't know. Yeah. So it was that was a bit open end, but I'd say maybe like sort of like backtracking a bit with DM tip because yeah, we. Irina unfortunately got a bit forgotten about in the final episode. So for people who are running what happened to her, when the group first fought Strahd on the rooftops, uh, things were all chaotic. He revealed like, oh, you guys don't actually have Morden uh, Kanan with you anymore. It was actually me all along. And then it got to find where they, you guys chipped away all of his allies. You were down a bunch of stuff. And then Boshak got off a telekinesis that pinned him and then Bucephalus came in ethereal to him and that basically was the end of the that first part of the whole thing so where you guys are like all right he's hurt but we are out of everything right now so do we short rest or do we just try and go power through this and end it now and you decided no we need to short rest we need to otherwise we can't win this and from that short rest he had the time to totally turn arena so now she was a vampire so then when you guys got down to the crypt big battles and whatnot finally defeated strong and then she was there and she woke up as a vampire and here's where like probably one of my biggest regrets looking back on the campaign is i had esmeralda grab the luck blade that you guys knew about and she used the wish to turn arena into back into a human to which I should have had her give the luck blade to one of you guys to make a wish. But being first time DM, I was so scared of the spell wish that I didn't let that happen. No, which... I know. I, I actually, I, I totally think it worked. I, I, it worked for Esmeralda's character is great. And I actually, I wish I didn't cut that scene out. But it's like, I think, I think that, that you made the right call in doing that. Because it's like, we kind of wanted to like wrap it up. If we had, if they had said like, oh, here's a wish blade, we would have been like, Oh, we gotta we gotta spend the next two hours figuring out how to phrase this so we don't get screwed over, you know, kind of a thing. Yeah, and that may have been another thing where in the moment I'm just like, I also kind of like it's at a good note. I don't want to chance anything going wrong, but 
yeah, it's one of the things where I feel achy about still thinking back on it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, don't worry about it. It's it was a great scene, uh, and we we would have wished for the same thing. Uh, so it worked out uh, totally fine. Um, but yeah, it it was. In my notes, I actually, the reason why it didn't end up in the replay is that Irina gets turned into a vampire and then we find a wishblade and we expend the wishblade to turn her back into normal. And so I sort of like in my notes, I'm kind of like, well, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to cut stuff out that, you know, she, she takes a step back and then she goes a step forward. Like, it's kind of like, it's a neutral thing. So I'm just going to kind of ignore it because now I suddenly have to introduce this weapon and I have to introduce this conflict and I have to introduce this stuff. And then like, well, it kind of went forward and went back, but actually what was funny as I thought about, it, I'm like, fuck, I totally should not have cut that scene. <laughs> and the, the reason why the big part of it is that it really doesn't develop Irina's character per se it. And I'm like, well, you know, it doesn't, you know, and it, it develops Esmeralda's a little bit. But the big character it develops is Strahd because it shows just how fucking petty this asshole is that it's like, if you guys can't have her, no one's going to have her, you know, kind of a thing that this like he's got a hostage and he's like, fine, I'm just going to kill the hostage because he's like he he believes that he he has a claim on her. And if he dies, you know, he like lets go of this claim and she's going to run off and have this like happy life or something like that. And he he has to kill her to make sure that it's like, she doesn't get away, you know, kind of a thing that, and it's, it's a great character moment for like, in my notes, I'm just like, God, it's this asshole. He just did this thing, whatever, fuck him. You know? And it kind of like, we, we eventually resolve it, but like, it's such a good character moment for him just to show how like petty he is that he's, he's going to kill his own hostage that he has, you know, just like I, if I can't have her, no one's going to have her. Like I'm not letting her get away. Period. Yeah, pretty much. It's just Strahd always has to give one last little fuck you to the party. <laughs> yeah. But uh, but yeah, I think all in all, that's pretty much what had we had scoped out for Arena. Like, I don't really think anything else got cemented in. She basically hopped on the wagons with the Vistani as they left. So that way she could get out of Barovia. And then maybe she got to the Far Gone Realms. Maybe she's still in one of the other demi planes of dread, like. Uh, Ez and Van Richten are. Yeah, her her ending was more of a mystery than everyone else's. She's just like where she left and she's gone and she's having her own life now. Um, yeah. Then we've got the pool in Kresk. Yes. This one so, got you and cut. I have talked about this a lot. <laughs> we cut the it got cut the fuck out of it, and I remember I was like, "Why did you cut it?" And he 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 hands the book over to me, and I open up the book. And I, re- I just read the entry and I'm like, are you fucking serious? Because <laughs> I, I was pissed. Yeah, which this was something where it's like, I think even the first time I read it, I'm just like, wait, what? Because for those who don't, or do you want to talk what it is? <laughs> so, and it's it's also funny because on the subreddit, there's a little bit of, of like conflict. Some people love it. Some people hate it. Um, so what happens in the scene is that the players come to Kresk and they've got hopefully Irina with them and they uh they're going around they're kind of exploring the town and they they come up on this pool this like pool of of water and it's um it's this sacred pool and uh they go up to it and they're like looking into it and this is let me this is just a random pool just sitting there and there's no guards or no nothing they just kind of they just find it it's just there and you go up to the pool and um what happens is there's this kind of glow that comes off of it and through the waters they see the image of sergey strahd's brother you know irena's or um tatiana's like lover he says uh, tatiana is that you and it's like sergey yes it's me and it's like please come with me i'll take you away from here and tatiana says yes my love and she approaches the water and she goes into the water and they grasp each other and then you see their images float away and Irina is completely gone from the story. She's just uh-huh. fucking gone. She just leaves the story. Just a random pool. Sergei's just sitting there and he's like, hey, you want to come with me? And she's like, okay, cool. And it there, there are two. So there's two options. There's one option that that happens. And then there's the other option where, um, she like, she sees him and he's like, Oh, come with me. And it says if the party stops him, says like, wait, no, don't do that. 
uh, Strahd says, no, she is mine. And a lightning bolt strikes from the heavens and hits the water. And suddenly the pool is just normal water. It's like it has been, you know, tainted or something like that. And Sergei is is gone. You know, he's like lost from from her and that that portal is permanently closed and um and even if she like if she's gone strahd you, you hear a voice in the heavens he's like no no she was mine she's mine he's, he's like really pissed but um basically there's two options either Irina is permanently gone from the story or strahd stops them and why why would you have this scene where one of the characters just leaves <laughs> yeah it's not even just one of the characters it's the character that you kind of like because yeah, there's always like with with everything with Curse of Strahd, a lot of it comes around to the arena problem, where you have to make that your characters care about her right off the bat. Otherwise, so much of this module is so hard to run because she's the driving force there. Yeah, the the entire plot line is around her character being in the story because he's constantly after her. He wants her. He obsesses about her. That's his that's his curse. That's his torture. And if she is just out of the story, you know, suddenly it completely changes the character motivations because if the characters are like trying to protect this girl, this woman, and she's just gone, it's like, okay, what are, what are we doing here? You know, kind of a thing. Yeah, exactly. And then and another one that's and this is something again. Curses, r slash curses rod i'm gonna be mentioning it many times and often on this because it is the best thing you can find if you want to dm this module someone did a write-up on that scene that totally had like totally convinced me that this was a bad scene should be cut because this character arena who if you are into roleplay stuff like you can build her up into so much like i've heard of so many people doing things of like oh arena depending on the different characters she with maybe she'll gravitate towards one and ask them to like can you help teach me to do what you do so that way she can be more helpful like in combat or whatever? And so you should hopefully have built up quite a relationship with this character. And then you get to the pool and suddenly Sergei shows up. He's like, Tatiana, my love. And suddenly Arena, the character Arena is gone. She's just totally, whatever you've built up on the way is just erased. And it's back to this Tatiana who you don't know. All you know about her is she's the one that Strahd has been obsessed with for however many hundreds of years. But Arena's gone. Now it's just Tatiana. She's like, oh, yes, it's my love, and goes to him and is just gone. And it's just like, this is the worst thing you can do to this character, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. And it's, um, I will say, I thought about it some more. And there are certain, like, there are certain ways, like, I might have it, like, oh, I could kind of see it working a certain way. like very, Or it's like, oh, I could kind of see where they're going with. But, like, very particular. The way that I see it, the, the my analogy is that... Um, I think you have you ever I, I assume you saw the series Samurai Jack. Yeah. Okay. That's most of it, I think. Okay. Yeah. It's there are there's a bunch of scenes where it's like Samurai Jack, he's going through this port, he's gonna get to this portal to go back in time, and then a coup shows up and is just like, fuck you, and like stops him. It's like, no, and he's like, it's like away from his grasp. And so I could see that scene being played out as like, oh, there's this portal. And then Strahd is like, no, it's like, you're not going anywhere. Ha ha ha. And so I could only see it being run if it's like 100% Irina is not going in that pool. Like, oh, yeah, there's this portal just sitting here for her to teleport out of. And then he just like takes it away. And so I could see that as being like another level of pettiness. But even then, that's so railroady because you have to guarantee 100% she does not escape. Like if to, I I still really don't like it. (laughs) Bad scene in my opinion. I just, I don't like it either. Because there's also, there's a similar thing where one of the like, like canon ends of the module is once you defeat Strahd, like, arena goes aside and suddenly the spirit of sergey comes in it's basically the exact same thing i'm just like no i'm cutting that too i hate all this stuff with sergey tatiana no Mm -hmm. arena is her own character no and it it makes me realize like sergey you know sergey uh never really like shows up that much in the module and tatiana doesn't like like i mean irena you know but like you never like oh suddenly i have my memories back and you can talk with like tatiana and stuff like that It, it doesn't really happen and so no, I've heard, I've seen homebrews of it. Like, there's some people that have tweaked the pool to be if she goes to the pool, the party lets her, then Sergey restores her memories of like all of her past lives type of things, so and you can like use that as an interesting mechanical excuse to make her turn into something else. But mm-hmm. I just I just decided to 
no, just cut, uh, it. Just on, cut on it. On that note, I have actually um, seen other uh, playthroughs of it where they give Irina like player class levels and make her um, like give her like paladin levels. Like that's really common. Yeah, and paladin. Really common. One of the interesting aspects of that is that at a certain level, paladins become like I think it's like seventh or eighth or something like that. They become immune to charm, and there have can't do that to arena. <laughs> and it's funny because it's like there are many many uh, stories that I've heard where it's like oh suddenly like immune to charm, and it's like Strahd comes in like yeah you are going to do what I tell you to, and then she's like no and or something and um I, i've usually heard it being more of a problem because he's trying to like lure her somewhere and it's like actually since she's a paladin she should be immune to that yeah it's uh but i think that's also people a lot of times when i've read it it's like you kind of with arena use it sort of like the sidekick rules in a way so it's like you can give her player class levels but she should never be she should never really level up that much that it would should get to that point but I mean, people, again, like, there's also the whole thing where, like all D&D things, like, this is with our game. We don't think this would have worked at all if you have it in your game and it worked out great. Like, fantastic. That's perfect yeah. for you guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When we're, when we're criticizing stuff, like, I guess, it, like, in a lot of different games, you know, they have different play styles and stuff like that. But for us, we're like, okay, we got to cut this. Like, this is not going to work for us. Um, yes. Uh, all opinions here uh another difference is the magic stones uh those are not in the Uh, module they kind they are actually but not to the extent that i use them oh yeah yeah because it's like okay they're they're technically present but it's like there's in in r5e one it's like you are you don't go around like breaking them or something no yeah no in the it as written in the 5e module it's Oh, all they're used for is to grow grapes. And it's just the Mardikovs asking you, please, can you go get it back from Yester Hill? And maybe if you are willing to do it, can you get it the other one back from Babo Saga? And then it's like, okay, well, then where's the third one if I can get that for you? And the modules just like shrug. <laughs> has no idea. And so actually it was a mix of curses r slash curse rod and then also i looked into the i think it was 3.5's expedition to castle ravenloft the stones were a much bigger deal there where it was a lot more pretty much how i ran it where these different fanes are uh giving strong ability because he sub subjugated them and these stones are kind of used in a way similar into that module where if you re-sanctify the fanes then strahd loses those uh power boosts mm-hmm. so it's just kind of a little bit of mixing matching there okay uh so we're kind of reaching close to the end there there are like one or two questions that i think are interesting that we haven't gotten to um sure. one was what was the most broken thing that us as players had that you're like constantly had to worry about or was a pain in your butt and the very last fight, I went through basically all of your guys' characters going, all right, what? Because, okay, because, yeah, there's this, there's whole things with DM versus player mentality, but I'm playing Strahd, who is a military genius, who knows everything about you. So it's like, okay, Strahd would know all these things. He's seen you in action. And so it's like, okay, each character had something I was worried about. Bojack especially, that freaking telekinesis, telekinesis. is... Telekinesis is just... Because as you said before, Strahd's a glass cannon. I had things in there that boosted him a bit, but still, dude's got like 150 health. Cross did, during the fight, critted him while he was at full health, and suddenly he was at less than half health. Plus we have Godfrey, who also can do that. Yes. And then you've got all the sunlight stuff going as well. Like Strahd's whole, the only way Strahd can survive is if he stays mobile. He ducks in, shoots you, moves out. Telekinesis shuts that down and telekinesis shuts it down worse than anything else because it's not a saving throw. So he can't use legendary resistance. He has to use his strength modifier, which isn't bad, but it's competing against the primary casting ability of the person spending it. So they're going to be much, much better. So telekinesis was the biggest one. I'm like, crap, how do I get around this? Um, Other than that, Garo with the, all he needs is one or two bad rolls on a stun, and it's the exact same issue. Um, like the stun could have easily just drained all of his legendary resistances. C- 
crust just being a paladin with the sun sword it's just if he gets too close then that's a problem and then gouda the biggest problem which i don't think with the videos it showed very well it's part of the whole dark gifts thing is i did this homebrew ability of hers which is was so broken that i had to like kind of midway tweak it a little bit to not be 100 percent broken where she as part of a beholder thing could instead of spending a spell instead use her action to fire some eye beams which is like that's cool it's thematic oh god it's so good <laughs> yeah because i was gonna add, like which were the eye beams that were like really powerful because it's like i think i remember like there was a charm ability which kind of didn't really do that much or something like that but there were yeah, there was one that basically used a uh, moonbeam, so it was like just some radiant damage that could potentially just, I mean, any kind of radiant chest damage healing, which hurts. Um, I can't remember if I gave her a toned down disintegration or anything like that, but it's just the chaotic sorcerer, total randomness, who knows? Oh, plus, every time she used a beam, roll magic table twice because that's also part of the magic gift of accepting everything she could roll twice and choose which one she wanted so it's just gouda was just a, literally the most wild of wild cards where it's like i can't plan for what's going to happen with this yeah we might have some extra unicorns or maybe a modron who's just going to be hanging around doing stuff who knows yeah. <laughs> it's all right because in the final battle i got to just riddle one of the unicorns with arrows which was very cathartic for strut okay i think I think we might have already done this question. What would you change if you ran it again? Uh, I, yeah, I probably the sprinkles and stuff in there. Um, biggest one, Godfrey. Um, probably wouldn't give him to you guys. I think it would have been a lot more tense without him. I feel like in a way he, I don't, to a sense, he did trivialize some encounters. Um, the final battle could have gone either way, but I think a big thing with, him like coming in with all that extra damage really swung the needle far more in your favor than it otherwise would have been and the draco lich fight probably could have been a little bit more interesting if he didn't freaking crit like on there with a smite so godfrey's probably the biggest one um the luck blade is another one that i potentially would have rethought how to do it um other than that, honestly, I think I was pretty darn happy with how th how our campaign went. Because because the, the, there was one other thing that you talked about. I don't know if you changed your mind or anything. I remember you had said like we got magic items like really early, like magic weapons, and you're like, I don't know if I would have done that again. Oh yeah, the the cursed items that Vasily gave you guys, right? Um. I think I like in hindsight thinking about it, it's like and kind of as I've DM'd a bit more with it, I'm fine with it. Like okay, the only it. thing it really did was like maybe it made the werewolf encounters a little bit more doable than they otherwise would have been. But I mean, you kind of at the beginning, like with the whole Kiro coming in, biting is Mark. You guys got to experience the wait, our weapons didn't hurt this one random wolf out of the entire pack. Oh, wait. And it's like. Yeah, I get what you're saying because it's like you already played out that scene so it's like why would I have another one because it's yeah so yeah no I think with that one I have over time changed my mind where I'm like and I said before like my little joke of like oh if the encounter's too easy I add more goblins and it's just like it's, I've gotten to the point where I'm like I don't care if my players are like kind of quote unquote too powerful because that just means I get to add more powerful monsters against them or oh wow or that's that's great for you it's really it was really good that we get to, to do that <laughs> oh please the last campaign that. you added a god to specific that ability to kill my unkillable character yeah exactly i was like because you're <laughs> oh my god that freaking i forget so it was what's it called a um something barbarian uh, zealot zealot, zealot barbarian yeah. so cannot be killed so hard to freaking kill or it's like you got to use sleep and it's and you kept asking like does this guy have sleep like does he have it it's like no one has sleep okay no like <laughs> you're not fighting first level wizards <laughs> no instead he just had power word kill no yeah that was uh <laughs> yeah power word uh that was that was my way around that <laughs> uh -huh. he could do that every other round so that's that was nice. <laughs> <laughs> that was also a real fun fight. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, but anyway, was there anything else? Uh, we've kind of reached the end of my questions, uh, and it's it's quite well. Uh, but was there anything else you wanted to let the audience know about Curse of Strahd, about running it? Was there anything else that you wanted to talk about that was like surprising or interesting? Um, surprising or interesting? Um, I would highly recommend it, but you've got to definitely have like there's a lot of stuff with modules where I think you kind of maybe want to, especially with Curse of Strahd be tempted to oh i'm just gonna like drop them into it because it's just in the middle of nowhere type of thing curse strata i think is too dark to do that there's just so many things that are just so heartbreaking i don't think you can do that i think people need to at least come in knowing at least at a high level like by the way this mur- this module has a lot of child murder like we had the joke in there that you made of how like you can't go 10 feet in Barovia without there being another missing child. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, and yes, yeah, so like it's funny, but it's also like true. It's like, if you have an issue with kids being like abducted, like this, you can't run this model really without some heavy, heavy modification. Also you're, these hags are feeding people, these kids. And it's just, Baking them. Yeah, yeah, there was actually there was a group online that was considering like, oh, I might want to run Curse of Strahd with and I start with the death house. And like I didn't run it for them. But I was just thinking like we start with the death house where you have the two kids locked upstairs that like starve to death and are like trying to claw their way out. And you have the two ghosts. And I'm like, there there are definitely people I've met who cannot handle this or it's like this is just they don't want to play in this world. Yeah. And I think it's totally legitimate. Like, Curse of Strahd, you need to have the right mindset and right group of people to play this module. It's phenomenal. Like, I can't, I cannot say that enough. This is – I agree with all the reviews saying this is one of the best modules out there. However, like, problematic you might find a lot of things. It's a phenomenal module to run. Like, I highly, highly recommend it. Other thing, actually, before I do this, because speaking of problematic things, please don't play the Vistani as written. Like – it's so bad. <laughs> they are just like, cause they are just like the worst types of stereotype of Romani people. <laughs> and they all, the only, the bad versions are what you see. And, and plus they're like, also like villains. Like most of them are like assassins and stuff like that. And they're like, yeah. I think in the book, like they almost always attack the players or something like that. Or they, they don't, if you pay them or something, they're basically bandits. Yeah, they. I think literally the character types, they the NPC type blocks they use for them are bandits, and so with the added like Vistani curses and whatnot. But it's just like I just found that to be totally uninteresting. I'd rather have them be ones where it's like they're either helpful to you, like Esmeralda is an obvious exception with that, or Madame Ava is also an obvious exception to that, or like make it sort of just kind of like morally gray, where it's like they're here and people hate them. But it's because they kind of like partly can't and partly won't do anything about the circumstances because it kind of benefits them to just be there because they have a pact with Strahd from way back when. And I mean, it like I think they're trying to answer like why, you know, they're they're going in and out and bringing people in. But like sometimes they need the help and sometimes Strahd is forcibly pulling people in. And it's nice to have some like companions or some people who like kind of help you out. And I have actually the other times I've played it or like seen other people running it or something like that, where the Vistani are like openly hostile and there's part of the plot line where you're supposed to go to Vistani camp and like talk to people. And then you talk to Madam Ava and she does a card reading and the players are always like, why would we listen to her? She's trying to kill us, you know, kind of a thing. So she does the yeah. card reading. It's like, why would we listen to this Vistani that's telling us that Matt, this Madam Ava wants to talk to us. That sounds pretty sketchy, but like, if you know they're like either neutral or kind of on your side, then it's like, okay, we need this help from these people. But like, and it also, it helps you to help them and their plight. Cause like they're here and everyone fucking hates them. Like everyone just despises this group. And so there's a lot of like empathy, like natural empathy that I think the group elicits because they're hated that they get killed everywhere else they go. And this is the one place where they can find a home because Strahd is on good terms with them. And so I think that it's it's another way to kind of draw on the players to their plight of like look we're kind of stuck here like this is our home but like this evil tyrant has taken over like can you please help us you know and so i think that that kind of helps to like draw people in yeah i agree so yeah i think that's just that's one of those biggest things with it 
Um, but yeah, other than that, like any other kind of notes I have with it. Um, so, I mentioned earlier also, Arena is going to be probably also one of the biggest things you need to worry about because I think it's very hard. I personally think it's very hard to run this module if you don't immediately have character investment in her. It's there's actually a really rough patch like very early on where you you go into Barovia and then you're there and you like do the death house and then Ismark comes up to you and says, "Hey, can you help my sister?" And it's like, "Okay." And so you're just with the family and then Strahd shows up and it's like, "Okay." You know, or something or like Rahadine shows up or something. And there there's this like rough patch where you're just kind of you sort of feel like an interloper where you're just kind of with this family now and need to be helping them because the module tells you to and it's like you have to kind of build up that trust to get to the point of like oh, okay we have to help her yeah which i think the way that helped with our group at least is there's a couple like with all modules there's a couple different entryways they give you for it i think a popular one is people like werewolves are causing havoc so let's go hunt some werewolves i went with the one where it's literally the it's a fake one but it's her father at like sending a message saying please help my daughter and that's the prompt i gave where i'm like please make when you are making your characters have it in mind that this is what they see and this is why they're coming here just so in coming into it you guys you're like all right there's a kind of uh damsel in distress basically as the horrible yeah. some people hate the cliche there's a damsel in distress and we're coming here to help her there, there is one other factor that I'm remembering, which is the miss of Brovia. I have actually seen it used uh, as like you didn't really use it that much, but I've seen other DMs use the miss of Brovia to like, oh, I need you to go to Kresk and not Velaki. So you, when you're going to Velaki, like, ooh, there's a miss there, and like, oh, you're taking exhaustion, and so it forces you to go in a different direction. I've seen that uh, be used. Yeah, yeah, like that's when we're like. <laughs> that's that's way too that's way that's, too gm's finger that's, that's like they're literally literal railroading finger. that's literally railroading. <laughs> that is the finger coming down and scratching off the ant trail so you can't go there yeah because like that's like with a lot of the comments like there's always the people like with listen story it's like oh my god like gm is so railroading and whatnot and it's like i know i'm not because i never did things like that no i, I know always, on the table railroading is a very weird term like it's made because it's made me think about it because it's like we we got attacked by guards you know or something we lost the fight and people were like that's railroading but like i was from my perspective i'm thinking like there were so many choices that led up to that moment you know kind of a thing that it like made sense or even the saint andrews and stuff like that that it's like i really didn't for from my perspective i didn't feel it railroaded it's like you know you you light a building on fire and it's like starting to burn and you come, you leave and you come back and like, there's suddenly an inferno and like, obviously you can't put the building out then, but you could have put it out when the fire was started, you know, or something. Yeah. I say also with the guard thing as well, that was, those guards just had amazingly lucky roles during, uh, Boshak. I think, yeah, Boshak used shatter and they all managed to barely save. So they survived because otherwise, a couple bad rolls and you guys would have leveled all the guards and then who knows what would have happened at that point yeah that would have been a very different situation plus like they all knew us because we went up to the guards and gave them the pastries or something like that trying yeah. to sell them and so they knew who we were like we were not being you know hiding about it but basically there were like small instances like anytime the players like lost or there was a consequence like, I think that there were some questions of railroading and it's like, I didn't feel railroaded, but it also, it, it goes into debates of like, it's one thing to like, as a player, like, oh, I want to have my character do this thing. And then you do this thing. But it's another thing to desire a specific outcome. Like I'm going to go talk to the king and convince him to be on our side. It's like, it's not real. Okay. You go up to the king, but he throws you in jail. You know, like that's not railroading. It's like... <laughs> That's the consequences for what you said. You don't, you don't, you don't own a specific outcome, you know, kind of a thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. So, yes, I guess just slight little like clarification for people who are wondering that sort of thing. Yeah. yeah so there were a lot of options on the table, basically, is what we're trying to say. Um, and it even like he even submitted he like uh, when I was writing the replays, I got his notes from it. And it's like, here are the 10 things that can happen from this, this, this. And so it's like he he had a lot of different options available for us each session. No, oh, thank you, Ben. 
Thank you. But uh, trying to think, any other last notes with the entire campaign of this, um, or like any other, I guess, little tips I can think of, like people might want to run this module other than what I've already said. And I'm not sure. Yeah, I'll run through it myself. Okay, we like leveling. I think we we did one level you know, every so often, like, well, I mean, in the book, it tells you how to level. It's like, it tends to be milestone. Yeah. Yeah. That's just my personal preference with it is I don't uh, XP is just way too much bookkeeping for my taste. So oh, it was God. kind of got to like, I just, this feels like a good point. Or it's like, you guys did this big event here. So I was like, yes, you can, you obviously can level up now. I think that's about it. I mean, we got an hour and 40 minutes of material. Oh, yeah. so. <laughs> plenty for you to already try and cut down. And I'm sure if there's anything else that either of us can think of, there's going to hopefully be the whole player recap as well. That we oh, yeah, yeah. Because we can actually, when we do the, that thing, we can do that. Um, so I'm actually going to do the wrap up now. All right. Sounds good. Uh, anyway, uh, so that's it. Thank you for being with me for this amount of time. It was quite long, but I appreciate you for going through all of my, the questions. <laughs> No problem at all. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, and it's great. I hope hopefully uh, you guys uh, got some information on running Curse of Stride and running games and stuff like that. Um, and uh, a big uh, shout out also to the Curse of Strahd subreddit uh, where they can you know discuss and talk about information. There's a lot of material that people have put up and different guides. Yep, yep. And uh, so I guess part of it with guests is always plugging themselves with social media, but I don't have much of a presence on social media i guess uh, either on like twitter or on Reddit or whatever you can find me at uh quiet know-it-all is normally the tag i go by on most things if i'm on it so i will yeah. put your uh twitter in the description so that way people can can add you there if they're interested in talking to you oh perfect mm -hmm. thank you and then people will be sending you questions like what the fuck seriously what the fuck what is wrong with you why why oh, yeah. are you like that gonna have to grow thick skin real quick <laughs> <laughs> no i i did feel kind of bad for you guys because it's like you're it's like i'm used to this like oh throw this stuff in the oven throw it out to the world whoever but it's like i kind of threw you guys into the oven <laughs> no but uh, it's also like with with it like there's little things but for the most part you actually seem to have a really damn positive community like no oh, thanks yeah you guys are wonderful because for the most part everyone's kind of like like really just kind of like yeah they get a lot of good opinions went up but even when someone's like i really like this seems really dark like why would the dm do this and there was tons of people that jumped in like i've run this module i've read this module like the dm this is what it's like like this isn't them being an asshole this is what this barovia is barovia sucks yeah 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 <laughs> yeah there was a lot like even when someone was like very critical you know they they'd have reasons for it or sometimes people would like kind of come to your defense of like look you know it's a difference of opinion and stuff Mm -hmm. and plus i mean the 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 my audience tends to be a bit older so it's like people have reasons for like i don't like this thing and this is the reason why i don't like it yeah which is fine mm -hmm. everyone's got their opinions and as long as it's well thought out i have no problem listening to criticism okay anyway that's it thank you for being on here and i'm gonna stop recording thank you all right thank bye you bye